Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Phoenix City Councilwoman Thelda Williams. Animal abuse is one of the earliest indicators that an individual is developing a pattern of seeking power and control through abuse of others. A person who is capable of abusing animals will eventually be involved in violent crimes against domestic partners and other family members, which can lead to violent crimes outside the home. To begin today's show, we will discuss the connection between domestic violence and animal abuse. Later, we will check in on a development at Deer Valley Airport. Joining us to discuss animal abuse and its link to domestic violence is City Prosecutor Vicki Hill and Elizabeth Ortiz, Executive Director of Arizona Prosecuting Attorneys Advisory Council. I'll say APEC. Perfect. Much easier. So, yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. You have been my right hand for several years now, writing ordinances uh, against animal abuse, and you also are closely connected uh, because we both continue to fight domestic violence. So tell me what you do. Well, first of all, thank you for your support over the years. It's always very uh, helpful to have someone who really is consistently passionate about this issue. So our office does all the criminal misdemeanors that occur in the city of Phoenix. And encompassed in that, we charge about 7,600, let me say that again, 7,600 domestic violence cases just in 2017. And we've all, that's a lot of domestic violence cases. And we've also charged um, approximately 200 animal cruelty cases just this year. Now, I don't have numbers that link, link and tell me when an animal was, abu was involved in the domestic violence case, but anecdotally, I can tell you it does happen. I know so many victims of domestic violence will not leave their home because they don't want to leave the animal, the dog, and the dog is threatened. Um, it's a vicious circle they get caught up in. So I'm very excited that you are passionate about this and do your best to make sure that people pay the penalty when there's domestic violence and or animal abuse involved. So Elizabeth, what do you do? I'm the executive director of APAC, otherwise known as the Arizona Prosecuting Attorneys Advisory Council. Well, easy for you to say. <laughs> I've had a little bit of practice. It is a mouthful. I take a deep breath before I, I announce the, the agency name. We are a state entity, and it is our responsibility to train the state, county, and city prosecutors across Arizona. So we train all year round on a wide variety of topics that help our prosecutors and the other people within prosecution offices um, do, do their job to the best of their ability. The, um, there actually is a council, so the, the C in APAC stands for a council, and the council is comprised of leadership from across the, the state. It includes the 15 elected county attorneys, the attorney general, several chief city court prosecutors, such as Vicki Hill, um, we also have the Oral Valley Town Prosecutor. We have the Dean of one of the state's two law schools. It's currently the U of A Dean. And we have the Director of the Administrative Office of the Arizona Supreme Court. So in total, we have 23 people who have um, a wide variety of jobs within the system and also um, represent a wide variety of geographic areas around the state. One of the things that, that we focus on throughout the year is domestic violence, training on, on how to best serve our victims, how to best prepare our, vic our prosecutors to handle these cases, and um, also the link between domestic violence and animal abuse. Are these cases hard to prosecute? In thinking about this issue, Elizabeth put me in touch with one of the county attorneys and he does a lot of animal cruelty cases and he sent me some of the pleadings and I, I won't go into detail because they're very graphic um, but you see it as a, as a family dynamic and, and we see it in misdemeanor cases as well especially with domestic violence cases we've had cases over the years I remember one in particular where the abuser in order to control his girlfriend um, took the cat and threw it against the wall, a small kitten, and threw it against the wall. So um, factually, often, because the abuse happens inside the home and the person who is being abused is afraid of the abuser, having that person testify can be a challenge. So in that way, they can be difficult to prosecute. 
Um, but with animal abuse cases, we have good partners in the Humane Society, and they will, they will do a lot of the investigation, and they are experts, and they can come in and help us with those cases. Good. Do you see that across the state? We, we do. The, um, unfortunately, domestic violence is not limited to any one area or any one, any one um, class of people. It affects everyone in every walk of life. And the impact on the animals in the home is also seen across the state. You know, one of the, um, one of the additional challenges that we've seen is where the victim is very hesitant to leave the abuser um, because they don't have the ability or don't believe they have an option to take the family pet with them. And therefore, the, the victim chooses to stay, stay in the home um, and continue to be, to be abused. I worked with a, a couple of agencies, and um, they will take the pet, which was a big accomplishment. I can mean, remember a decade ago, it, I don't think that was available around the valley. And now more and more people are involved in domestic violence prevention and, and helping the victims, and they recognize uh, the connection between the two. And I'm glad you brought that up because it's nice to know that there is hope out there, you know, when you're watching this and, and you feel like, well, what if I want to leave? Um, there are programs, the Humane Society has a, a program where for a short period of time, when the victim wants to leave the situation, they will house the pet. Um, mm -hmm. Sojourner Center, who, which is a domestic violence shelter, will take the family pet so that the person can leave. And that's very important to know because as Elizabeth said, many times the, the victim will not want to leave because they're leaving a pet that has become part of the family knowing that harm could come to that pet. So to know that they can take that pet with them brings them a lot of comfort. I've been a prosecutor since 1993, and in, in my years in this, in this field, I've seen a real development, uh, a recognition on behalf of law enforcement, on behalf of prosecutors to um, see a, a bigger picture, to see the link um, the role that the animals play often in the abuse, and to, to see that it's not simply a, a, a simple solution of make a police report and, and we'll call you when our next court date is. These types of crimes are, are so personal and are so interweaved with, a, with larger family dynamics that what, what I've seen is um, the shelters responding and advocates responding and law enforcement and prosecutors trying to, to look at this in the best way to, to do justice in these cases. And, and I believe that's really grown in a very positive way in the last few years. You know, I think it's interesting, you know, the city had the five-year domestic violence prevention plan mm -hmm. and we're in the fifth year. And I was asking somebody, I said, um, have we made progress? And it was one of those good news, bad news. Yes, we've made progress. We're in high schools, we're providing classes on anti-bullying and, and what can lead to domestic violence. And, and we've changed the forms of police work so there's consistency, better information for you to prosecute. But now we have more cases. And I, I attribute that to the fact that we've really publicized the fact that there are services available and people are more willing to take the risk to leave, and whether they're taking their animal, their kids, whatever, and we provided more homes. Is this something you see? It is. You know, you're right. It's kind of a double-edged sword. You, you do the um, educational component and then it brings in uh, more cases, and, and ultimately that's what you want because you want to address them, but there is a, a downside to that because you, you don't feel like you're making strides at stopping the issue. Um, you know the city has the Family Advocacy Center and that is just a great resource for victims because it is a one-stop shop for victims. It, it, they can come in and talk to a police officer and make a police report or they can come in and maybe they're not quite ready to make that police report, but they need advocacy services and the advocates are there. And it's co-located with child help. So there's, there's a natural um, cohesiveness to issues that they can come in and address. And across the state, there has been an increase in advocacy centers, that one-stop shop idea. Because for us, this, you know, in the prosecution realm, this may be the only interaction that we have with the victim is, is how it relates to their domestic violence issue. 
but there's a lot of other things going on in their lives. And that's the great thing, I think, about the advocacy mm -hmm. component. Even when you're a victim of a criminal case, when you come into our system, you're assigned a victim advocate. And that victim advocate is your advocate. You can talk to them about things that matter to you that you may not want to talk to the prosecutor about. And they can offer you resources for housing, for shelter. They can help you make safety plans. They can help you um, figure out how to be safe in your own home. What documents do I need to get together if all of a sudden I need to leave? Things that the average person just doesn't think about, um, but helps empower the victim to be able to, to make that step and to be able to leave. I've even heard where they've connected to an out-of-state family, provided airfare, uh, made sure that everything was uh, in line so that there was a successful uh, exit from the family situation. Exactly, and you know, safety really is the bottom line. Uh, you know, Elizabeth and I are prosecutors at heart and, and we like to see justice done. And justice is often done when an abuser is held accountable and also can get help to not repeat that pattern. But sometimes, safety is more important. And so we have had cases where we've helped the victim um, escape to a different location and, and hide. And that's, that's a success as well. It is, it truly is. I, I think it's also important uh, for people who have um, violence in the home and they're not, the victim isn't planning on leaving. I mean, it hasn't escalated to a certain point. But then the children start becoming bullies, mistreating the animals, etc. That's a true warning sign. Mm -hmm. And do you ever see that involved in, in any of your cases? Well, um, yes and no. Um, we don't deal with the child as, as the perpetrator in the cases that we deal with. But you do see that pattern. And what the studies show is that an early um, negative uh, or, or violence against animal is one of the big indicators that there is going to be violence that continues, either in the home or just in general, as you said. But you know, there, there is hope. Um, orders of protection can include an animal, so a victim can- I didn't know that. Yeah. They, they can include their animal Absolutely. on the order of protection. So that's a positive thing. Um, and so we are making strides, I think, but it's a never ending battle. Well, we're about to the end, so I need uh, any important thing. Real quick, tell me. Um, I would just emphasize the, the importance of supporting the family advocacy centers and recognize them for also incorporating animals in that process, bringing, bringing therapy dogs in to, to assist victims as they work their way through that process. They have been, I think, uh, a beam of light for all victims. Great. Well, I thank both of you for being on the show. And uh, as we continue to work on this issue in the future, uh, I really applaud all your efforts and all the extra distance you go to not only inform the public, but to prosecute people and really support ad advocacy. I can't even say it, because um, I'm on the Child Help Board mm -hmm. and I know how important that relationship is uh, between the center, the parents, and the good work they do with kids and the therapy docs. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. For thank us. you. And I want to remind everybody that Christmas is not the best time to give a puppy or a kitten as a gift. Um, it cannot end well. Uh, save it for spring. Easter is a great time to give those gifts. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll talk about development at Deer Valley Airport. What would you do if you saw a dog, a cat, or a horse that look like this. Animal cruelty and neglect is a crime that needs to be reported. I'm Councilwoman Thelda Williams, here with my rescued pets, Henry and Cheyenne. And I'm Councilman Michael Nowakowski, asking for your help. If you ever suspect animal cruelty, call Crime Stop, the Arizona Humane Society, or the Sheriff's Office. Animal cruelty is a crime. And together, we can stop it. Located 15 miles north of downtown Phoenix, Deer Valley Airport relieves air traffic from Sky Harbor and serves as a home to flight training, corporate jets, and general aviation, 
and more development is always great news for an airport. And joining us today to discuss what's going on at Deer Valley is Airport Manager Ed Farron. Welcome, Ed. Thank you for having me. You are busy up there. It's a very busy airport. In fact, it's the busiest general aviation airport in the galaxy. In the galaxy. I That's right. I'll buy that. <laughs> so tell us what, what's new. Well, we've got an awful lot of projects coming up um, that are very exciting for Deer Valley Airport. In fact, we've got our first vertical development uh, in 15 years coming up in 2018. Uh, we've got the Deer Valley Aviation Park, which is going to be in the uh, southeast quadrant of the airport. And we've got a developer who is going to invest approximately $11 million into uh, 70,000 square feet of aircraft storage space. Uh, and this was a project that was approved by the Phoenix City Council in November. Uh, the developer is now in the process of finalizing his financing. Once that process has been completed, he'll be in the process of pulling building permits and contracting with the building contractor, et cetera, uh, with the goal of putting shovels in the ground in the summer of 18. And with a little bit of luck, we'll be at the grand opening in late 2018, early 2019. Really? That's right. It's very exciting for Phoenix Deer Valley Airport. So what goes in there? It would be corporate jets, uh, primarily, uh, corporate aircraft of any sort, um, but primarily it will cater to the uh, corporate aircraft crowd. Uh, how many, give me an estimate of how many that could be. That could be, depending on the size of the aircraft, it's going to be, there will be five uh, hangars in total. Depending on the size of the aircraft, it could fit uh, as many as a dozen aircraft in those hangars. Do we have a lot of corporate jets go in and out of there? More and more uh, every day. It's always interesting uh, to see, you know, it's a general aviation airport. How many come in and out of there a year? Uh, a year, we've got about a thousand, excuse me, 380,000 takeoffs and landings every year. So if you do the math, that's roughly 1,050 every day. Every day. Every day. You know, and you, you do an excellent job. I seldom ever get complaints. Uh, I'm glad you would to hear think that. you've got neighbors all the way around you that uh, we, we did an overlay years ago, but uh, you just run a great operation. So. Well, thank you for that feedback. I appreciate that. And we try very hard to be a good neighbor to the surrounding community. And you are. So, and what else is going on? Well, hot on the heels of the um, project that I just described, we have got uh, a Cutter Aviation uh, project coming up. Uh, and Cutter Aviation is our sole FBO or fixed base operator at Deer Valley Airport and they proposed to build uh, their own corporate uh, hangar structure. Uh, this was just adopted by city council yesterday, uh, so we don't have a timeline uh, for this construction project yet, uh, but it'll be located adjacent their current leasehold at the airport um, and could house uh, probably uh, at least 12 or more corporate uh, aircraft as well. Uh, so probably construction sometime in 2018. Uh, I've met with Cutter a couple times in discussion on what went through the council yesterday. Um, I was surprised when they were telling me that California has become so expensive that it's less expensive to park at Deer Valley, go over and pick them up and fly whoever needs to go somewhere and then park back. At, is that what you hear? That is what I hear. Uh, somehow, financially, it makes more sense for the uh, aircraft owners to base their aircraft here in Arizona at Phoenix Deer Valley uh, and when it comes time to fly, they will fly their flight crew out commercially. Uh, they will pick up the corporate aircraft, fly back to pick up the aircraft owner, and then off to their destination. And that is more financially feasible than actually basing their aircraft in California. Well, I guess it's an advantage for us. We It sure is. We get the lease payment. You got it. <laughs> and the commercial flight coming in and out. I mean, there's That's all right. kinds of advantages for us. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a tremendous economic benefit to us. So. Uh, what else is going on? I just keep asking that question. Do you keep answering? <laughs> well, we've got a lot of projects coming up. Uh, in addition to the two, uh, two projects I just mentioned, we've also got uh, a signage project in the works. Uh, you may recall that our monument sign at the entrance to Phoenix Deer Valley Airport was damaged uh, by a vehicle that went off the road. Uh, and so not only was the, uh, the sign damaged, but it was also uh, the, the style of it was fairly outdated, so we took the opportunity to work with an architect to create a new, sleek, more modern design. Um, and at the same time, we're going to create some signage for the observation deck located um, on the north side of the terminal. 
Uh, we've got a very popular observation deck that's open to the public at no cost. It's uh, an elevated um, observation deck, so it provides an unobstructed view of the airfield. So we thought, while we've got these folks out there, we should take the opportunity to try to educate them on some of the things they might see while they're uh, at the airport visiting. For example, uh, they can see the control tower, so we can teach them about who's in it and what they do. Uh, we can teach them uh, why there are numbers on the runway, for example. And then we can also teach them a little bit about the aircraft that they'll see around and uh, talk about the performance specifications of each aircraft. Uh, and these two um, signed projects will be going to City Council for approval on January 10th. Um, if are you warning me? Is that what you're doing? I am. Okay. <laughs> and asking for your support at the okay. same time. Uh, if approved, uh, the signs uh, will be uh, probably constructed uh, sometime in late January, installed in February, and we'll have some uh, beautiful new modern signage at the airport. You know, it, it, you have a great restaurant, and uh, Sundays are especially fun out there because all the kids come with their parents to have breakfast and watch the planes. Right. They'll enjoy their breakfast um, down in the restaurant and then they'll head upstairs and spend a great deal of time um, at the uh, observation deck. And so um, since we've got those children up there, this signage hopefully can help us sort of spark an interest or inspire children uh, to pursue uh, an interest in aviation. You know, that's an uh, interesting comment because uh, I know ASU now has a school uh, that teaches different elements of aviation. And uh, I understand there's also a major pilot shortage. So that's a great career. Um, and mechanics, all the things that go with, you don't think about as you're going on a plane, but uh, it's a big industry and one that will be here in the future. That's exactly correct. Uh, there is a tremendous pilot shortage uh, for the airlines right now. It's been brewing for a number of years and it's finally being realized right now. Uh, and you're right, there's a very popular uh, aviation program at ASU uh, that is probably becoming more and more popular. Um, you know, around the airport uh, and the North I-17 corridor is developing so quickly with major corporations moving in or building there. And uh, I think you're going to see even more growth in the future. So. I, I'm just curious how, if you think that will have an impact, uh, you can handle it or not? Uh, we can certainly handle it, um, even though, as I mentioned, we're a very busy general aviation airport, we're not nearly at capacity. We can handle an awful lot more. Uh, and so as these uh, corporations and businesses spring up in the general vicinity, uh, we do anticipate receiving more traffic. Uh, and we're also confident that we can easily accommodate that. You know, maybe we should explain what general aviation is. General aviation is essentially, in a nutshell, uh, non-commercial aviation. So uh, the small single engine, propeller driven, piston engine powered aircraft that you see uh, oftentimes in flight training uh, is an example of general aviation. Uh, but then again, so are corporate jets. Um, sounds like that might be commercial aviation, but it's actually a component of general aviation. Well, for the most part, smaller than your commercial. Correct. Uh, so general aviation does not have scheduled airline service by definition. What special events do you have coming up? Special events, we've got uh, Santa visits us every December. Um, so he flies in on a helicopter. It's very popular with the community. Uh, he was uh, out at Deer Valley last weekend. He'll be here again this weekend. Uh, beyond that, we do expect to see um, some corporate aircraft activity um, in the month of uh, January with some of the bowl games that will be coming on, um, some of the car auctions that take place throughout the valley. Uh, all of these, the net result for us is increased uh, corporate aircraft activity. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? You have a big car show and you get more planes. Right. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the attendees of the car show arrive on corporate aircraft. So, and and I, people will say, are you a Scottsdale airport? But we're not. We're not a Scottsdale Airport. Um, Scottsdale Airport really caters almost exclusively to the um, corporate aircraft crowd, uh, whereas Deer Valley is sort of a hybrid. Um, it's a heavy flight training airport, but at the same time, uh, we're more and more seeing increased um, corporate aircraft coming into the airport. So we can accommodate both.
You know, I was uh, at a meeting many years or so ago. How many airports are there in Arizona? Uh, well over a hundred if you count those that are out on the reservations. It's amazing. There's a lot of airports that probably people have never heard of. I, I, would, I was shocked when I heard that. Um, but really, they are a low profile. They're such an asset. And what they bring economically to a community is phenomenal. That's correct, and some folks don't understand that. Um, uh, a, a, even a general aviation airport can be a tremendous economic engine to its uh, surrounding community. Just for example, uh, Phoenix Deer Valley Airport uh, recently had an economic impact study done. Uh, and if you calculate the direct, indirect, and induced impact um, of the airport, it comes up to somewhere just south of $200 million annually. Uh, which would probably surprise a lot of folks. Um, but it, uh, airports can be a tremendous economic engine uh, to their communities. What are some of the products that generate that for you? Well, employment. Um, Phoenix Deer Valley Airport has hundreds of employees, not just city staff, uh, but also federal government staff in the control tower. Um, there are uh, a number of businesses on the airport, uh, so they have aircraft mechanics, flight instructors, business people, finance uh, people. Uh, it runs the whole gamut, uh, and so as these folks uh, earn uh, their payroll check, they go out and spend it in the community, uh, and there's sort of a trickle-down effect, and so it's, uh, an airport can be a tremendous asset, uh, not only for ease of air commerce, but also just from a pure economic impact uh, perspective. Fuel? Um, the, uh, the city of Phoenix does not directly sell fuel, but Cutter Aviation sells fuel. We've also got a self-serve fuel island uh, on the north side of the airport. Uh, so just like uh, when you fill up your car, you swipe your, your credit card and fill up, there's the same sort of facility at Deer Valley Airport for airplanes. Oh, the visual of that makes me smile. Yeah, it's a little bit I different. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it works. Well, well, I thank you for coming today. You have uh, had a great opportunity at Deer Valley and you've seen the growth and you're making it all come together and be a true asset to the community. Well, thank you for your comments, and I want to thank you for your continued support of Phoenix Deer Valley Airport. Well, that's easy. That's a point of pride. I, I love Deer Valley Airport and always have. You just take the kids out there to watch them, and so it's great fun. It sure is, and I still do that. Good. That's all the time we have for this month's On the Issues. If you have any questions or comments about this show, call my office at 602-262-7444 or visit my website at phoenix.gov slash districtslug. We'll see you next time on The Issues.